Baldur's Gate 3. This game has taken gaming by storm these past few months. From bare sex scenes to developers rage quitting because this game is unrealistically good. However, I'm here to ask the question, is it worth it? Is it worth the time and money spent? Is it worth the heartbreak when my love Leeza only wants a one night stand and does not want to settle down out in the astral plane with some little who knows alien children? Uh, I, I mean, hey y'all, it's Troy here and I finally beat Baldur's Gate 3. Let's go. This game was massive and deep and difficult. And this took me a long time, about 85 hours to be exact. But I wanted to take my time and enjoy the game, as well as dabble in some multiplayer. Watch out, hold on. Let me clear this. Oh, there's a, there's a fucking guy over there. Oh. It's Balin. No, you're gonna kill Balin! No! Oh. Oh, he almost made it. He almost Dude. made it. Dude. If you're unfamiliar with these videos, I like to take a look at the game from a casual gamer's perspective. My perspective, the most numerous perspective. Someone that has a full-time job and responsibilities and just likes to play video games in their spare time when they are done toiling away at life's unimaginably boring tasks. I try not to look at the game from the angle of a content creator or a sweaty basement dwelling redditor that lives their lives online because that's not realistic or healthy. I like to simply ask the question, is it worth it? Is it worth the time? And here this is about 70 to 100 hours, the money and the energy because we all got a lot of other shit going on and so those things are really important to us. If you like my content or the video, please comment and subscribe. I enjoy engaging with you guys in the comments and hearing your takes, whether they're shit or not. You know, we can all have our own opinions and that's okay. And before I get into it, I know there is the whole drama of developers talking about how this game was too good and making unrealistic standards for gamers. I'll just say that is some absolutely whiny ass bullshit. I won't get into it too much, but I put a more in-depth opinion on that in my Baldur's Gate 3 impressions and discussions video, uh, so go out and watch that if you want my whole take on it. Just know that I think it's a real stupid angle for these developers to take. So with that, on to the review. Baldur's Gate 3. This game is a CRPG developed by Larian Studios that is centered in the Dungeons & Dragons universe and borrows from the 5th edition rule set. Larian's main claim to fame is the creators of the Divinity Original Sin series, in which Divinity Original Sin 2 actually was critically acclaimed and is cited as one of the best RPGs of all time. Now I've never played Divinity Original Sin 2, so I really don't have much to compare it to, but after playing Baldur's Gate 3, I do have a desire to go back and experience this game, but I'm coming into this with a fresh set of eyes. And if you are unfamiliar with CRPGs and Larian Studios, they are typically point and click bird eye view RPGs. And they are well known for their heavy roleplay elements, intricate complex storylines, and tactical turn based combat, which we will get to how all of these elements stack up later. And of course, as I've mentioned, this game is based on Dungeons and Dragons, and most of the mechanics are drawn from the 5th edition rule set. I've played a bit of D&D myself, so I'm familiar with the basic mechanics, but by no means am I an expert. You know, I won't get too much into how they adapted this with D&D, but overall I will say they did a really good job honoring the D&D source material while still making this fun and a bit better suited for a video game. It feels like a perfect adaptation of the tabletop. Visually, the game looks pretty good, nothing mind-blowing from the environments, and some of them can look a bit dated, while others can impress you and have a very high level of detail, but it was hit and miss there. However, the facial animations are a highlight, especially from your main companion characters. 
You can tell a lot of time and effort was put in here. In most scenes, the characters are very expressive. You will get the occasional dip into the uncanny valley with some goofy faces, but those are few and far between, especially compared to similar games in this genre. I also have to shout out the spells. The spell animations and effects are pretty sweet. My favorite classes were the spellcasters just because of how satisfying it was to chuck a fireball and watch a bunch of people burn to a crisp. When it comes to sound design, you know, the environment does a good enough job, uh, you know, with the spell sounds and sword slashes. Nothing really to talk about here, but I will say this is some of the best voice acting I've ever heard in a video game. Magnitude of what we're up against, I see no harm in considering the benefit this offer might afford us. Could be the only way to reach this source in one piece. Some of these characters, villains in particular, sounded so distinct that I'm sure I will remember the sound of their voice for years after I stopped playing this game. This paired with the facial animations make the cutscene and dialogue in the game a real treat, which is a very large part of what you'll be doing. On a performance level, there is some jankiness here. There isn't anything too game breaking, but I did run into a handful of awkward bugs and glitches such as a misplaced camera angle during a cutscene or dialogue or a delayed and awkward attack animation. With that said, there is a huge memory leak issue currently in Act 3 that really impacts frame rate. That in order to avoid it, I had to restart my computer every few hours. You know, more details on that later, but overall the technical issues did take away significantly from the gameplay. Baldur's Gate 3 definitely needed some more time in the oven. Now you're asking, how is the meat and potatoes of the game? What the fuck? The combat, progression, and general gameplay loops? Well, pretty damn good. This game is addicting as hell. Starting off with combat, which is a turn-based system that follows very closely with D&D. When combat kicks off, every character and enemy rolls for their turn order, which is affected by their dexterity skill. And at the most basic, you have three main parts of a character's turn. Movement, which allows you to move up to a certain meters. A main action, that's anything from an attack or a spell. And then a bonus action, which is usually something smaller like a jump or a shove or using a potion. Of course, like I said, that is the formula at its most basic. As you progress, you get all types of skills, potions, spells, enchantments, status effects, whatever you name it, that add or take away from this base formula. And everything you do is determined by a dice roll. You know, if you roll for an attack, it's going to roll with your strength. And that does add a level of RNG to the combat that can be frustrating at times. Um, but over long periods of time, it's going to smooth out because if your character has good strength, he's usually going to hit his attacks. Come on, baby. Let's go. Let's go. Ooh. Oh my goodness. And going into Baldur's Gate 3, this is what I was most worried about, as I'm usually not into turn-based combat in RPGs. I've struggled to get into any JRPGs and I've only played a bit of like XCOM which I enjoyed but my experience with it was limited. But I have to say I fell in love with it. I was always eager to get into a scrap which most RPGs I tend to try and talk my way out of most things but here I was kind of bloodthirsty. Just the amount of variety and different spells and effects here you know really open up your creativity and it's a extremely not one-dimensional, I don't know how to say that, an extremely multi-dimensional uh, combat system. And I've got to say, this combat is difficult at times. I'm gonna die to these fuckers for killing the spectator. And what am I supposed to do? Oh my god, man. Especially just coming off a game like Diablo where it was mindless clicks and reactions. You know, here you really have to take your time and prepare certain spells or potions and think outside of the box on how to defeat tougher encounters. 
and using your environment is huge here whether that be shooting down a chandelier or knocking over a weak statue onto a bunch of enemies pushing enemies off ledges and getting caught off guard while your party is weak or even getting surprised and snuck up on creates a huge disadvantage and if you aren't thinking through what you are doing or where you're going this will happen a lot and sure that creates a huge disadvantage but it also goes the same the other way Thinking through how you're going to approach certain encounters and sneaking up on enemies or coming in from a different angle is a huge advantage. The lowest difficulty, however, is pretty easy, so anyone that isn't too into combat and doesn't want to challenge can easily change that, which is good. I never even tried the highest difficulty because medium or balanced was tough enough for me, but I can only imagine for the masochists out there that this game can get real tough. And what rewards do you get for facing these tough challenges? Well, this leads me into the class system and progression. Again, following very closely to D&D 5th edition, there are 12 pickable classes here. And some of these classes are just really not that good, which kind of points at some balancing issues, but most are viable and you can even multi-class to really shake things up. If you're creative or do your research, you can find something that will work. I won't go into too much depth here as I'm sure there are a ton of videos out there on class guides, but the most noteworthy thing for newcomers to D&D is that there are only 12 levels, which might sound shocking to some. I remember when I told my friend I'm playing a multiplayer campaign with that the level cap is only 12, he was concerned. A 70 hour experience and you're only going to level up 11 times? Yeah, sounds kind of whack. However, Baldur's Gate 3 is a slow paced game, so the leveling matches that. Encounters can take a long time to get through, so naturally you will level up slowly. But the main point here is that every level feels important and extremely satisfying. Every time you hit that next level and get more spell slots or another attack or ability, you think, wow, this is huge, this is going to make a difference. And this kind of speaks to the game as a whole. Everything you do here has meaning and it feels deliberate and you never really ever feel like you're wasting your time or you're grinding or doing anything that's pointless. And the loot too, every piece of equipment feels unique and special. You know, it's pretty standard. You've got your armor pieces and weapons. They are categorized in your standard gray, common, green, uncommon, blue, rare, etc. color coding but the increase in rarity is much more than just a stat boost. They almost always have a meaningful power or ability or cool enchantment, sometimes even altering or being the core of an entire build. And the way you obtain a lot of this gear is badass too. Frequently they have stories behind them or you gotta take them from a cool boss or enemy. And this is far better than the loot boxes or RNG drops. This makes for a very rewarding and satisfying loot system. I'll try to speak quickly on the character creation because to me the character creator is not very important outside of the race and the background. I usually skim through it and make either a monstrosity or something that just sort of resembles myself. And the creator itself is good, you got all your faces and tattoos and hairstyles, nothing too groundbreaking or crazy here outside of course you got you know your standard genital slider. Oh I get to, I have to pick my genital. <laughs> I'm gonna go penis. I don't know if I should be showing this on stream. <laughs> I'm gonna go penis B. No, no, penis C. No, you actually you get to pick, Are you, you pick your penis. Are you serious? Yeah. I'm straight up. When you if you go to edit character on the left, you get to change your appearance. <laughs> and one of the options is your genitals. I swear, after Cyberpunk, every game has to have a penis or vagina slider. Like I get it, it's kind of funny, but I also really don't give a shit. If your resources could go to something else, please do, but whatever, I digress. Anywho, what's real important is your race and background. You got 11 different races, which also play into some of your initial stats. Although I'm happy to say not too much, you can create any race with any class and definitely make it work. You also have 11 backgrounds, 12 if you count the Dark Urge, which is kind of a special pre-built character that has murderous tendencies, which I've heard is really cool. That's what I'm thinking maybe doing a second playthrough with. But your background is a sort of backstory to your class. Again, playing into some initial stats and proficiencies, but you can make anything work with really any class. 
However, the most important part here is your race can affect the story heavily. Your background too, but mainly your race. Some races open up entirely new different dialogues or paths through the story. All these combinations really do allow for multiple playthroughs and I'm excited to dive back in. Now let's talk a little bit about the story. Of course, I won't be spoiling anything here because this is a story focused game so it's really best experienced fresh. And I'm happy to say it does not disappoint. It can be a slow burn at times. With extended fights, how slow your character moves to the game world, and just how long the damn game is, I sometimes found myself forgetting certain plot points. And it's very complex. There are a ton of different characters and factions and locations. It will reference pieces of lore that it kind of just assumes you would know. So be prepared to literally in-game ask another character with your character to elaborate further and the game usually does a decent job at shedding light there or to find some sort of book to read <laughs> or you can just look things up online you know don't be afraid i know sometimes people are weird with that but th that's what i mostly did when i kind of found myself getting lost i guess i'm kind of making myself sound like an idiot here you know me no understand story too complex stupid you know, my point is, is that you need to be paying attention and not skipping things to really follow what's happening here. But damn, is it good. You know, at first the plot seems a bit more personal, but then slowly crescendos into this massive world threatening plot with you at the center. And the choice really is yours. Do you want to be the asshole or do you want to be the savior or somewhere in between? You know, it's not cut and dry. It is much more nuanced and gray. So just have fun playing around in it. And the individual characters and side quests are all compelling as well. Well, most. I, I didn't really care much for Will. It's because you know the heart lurking under the horns. The people will see a curiosity. Maybe even a beast hungry for their souls. But I will slay their monsters. Keep them safe. And one day they will see the Blade of Frontiers again. Are you sure? The blade stands at the ready. Appreciate it, Will, but I want you to stay here, bud. You know, but each companion has their own plot line and story, and of course, you help shape that. I have to mention, yes, you know, you can romance them. They don't have that dick slider or vagina or whatever for nothing. Oh, I get to I have to pick my genital. <laughs> The romances themselves can be compelling and believable, but I do have to say, everyone in this game is horny as hell. It's kind of wild. That part is almost a bit unbelievable. Like companions will just obviously throw themselves at you, at least especially in the very beginning. You know, you will just have like slaughtered people and then you'll go back to camp and Minthara will flirt with you. It's, I mean, I guess it's kind of her thing, but it's still, it's like, Jesus Christ. Don't get about her! Don't get about her! No, 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 no! Last thing on the story that I want to mention is that the game is not afraid to make you live with the consequences. There are a lot of games out there with decision that allow you to go X, Y, or Z, but you know in the end, you know, you're going to be fine, or the fight or whatever is only marginally more difficult depending on your decisions. The consequences in this game, for the most part, are realistic and harsh. You know, there's no feeling like you have some sort of protection because you're the player character. No, there are some fights in this game you should probably avoid or just straight up run from. Now notice how I said consequences in the game for the most part are realistic and harsh. This is because the game does have a few glaring issues. I think Baldur's Gate 3 Act 1 and Act 2 are near flawless video games, if not flawless. However, Act 3 really does drop off in some areas, and it's not that Act 3 is particularly bad, it's just that compared to Act 1 and Act 2, which I said are fucking phenomenal, this just seems slightly above average. Baldur's Gate 3 really does kind of fall off a cliff. Now, is this because Act 1 had so much time to cook in the oven with the early access? Perhaps. This doesn't excuse it, but that does make sense. Act 3 feels rushed. The story and plot elements just don't fit together like Act 1 and Act 2 do. 
In Act 1, if you do something to a character such as let their daughter get killed, for example, or lie to them, they will react realistically and in a way that makes sense. If you kill their enemy, they will say, wow, thank you, we have common enemies. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna help you down the road. And I'm trying to say stuff here without spoiling anything. Everything you do feels so reactive in a way that was almost jarring for me at times. Like I was like, this game does not play by normal video game rules. You can't just do stuff and, you know, not and get away with it and not feel any consequences. Now in act three, this reactiveness just kind of goes out the window. I'm going to try and get into this without spoilers, but for example, in Act 3, I straight up lied to a pretty big character in order to infiltrate them and gain their trust, in which I later planned to betray them. At first, I got away with this lie, but then eventually got caught. Now, the character briefly reacted to it, but then never mentioned it again. And in the final climactic moments of the game, where the betrayal was coming to a crescendo, the character was surprised. I did not side with them. They seemed unreactive. I was like, excuse me? And also speaking of the finale, the last battle is pretty badass. But from a plot standpoint, it's also really messy. And going back to the betrayal scenario, in order to effectively betray this character, we will say character A, I needed to make a deal with character B. This deal with B was made a huge point by some of my party members and was relatively controversial and involved my decisions in the finale. A lot was on the line with this deal and some companions wanted me to portray character B as well. Now that deal was never brought up in the finale or anywhere near the end. Now did my character just get away with not following through? What happened? That was like a huge deal. Your companions are also much less reactive in act 3. They have much less to say about where you are or the decisions you're making. In Act 1, you can't even flirt with another companion without everyone making comments on it. Honestly, thinking about it now, it's kind of weird how little privacy you have in the beginning acts. But regardless, this really fleshed out each character and got them involved into the story, even if you weren't bringing them along as party members. This kind of goes away in Act 3. Along with a messy story and plot, Act 3 has noticeably more bugs and less polish. There is a huge framerate issue and memory leak. But this memory leak causes the game's framerate to go from above 60 to below 40 or 30 at times if you've played the game for more than an hour, which I hit a lot as I was playing this game for 8 to 10 hours at a time. And to me, the most important part of any video game or movie or story in that matter is the ending. If the ending is shit, then it makes everything I've done feel worthless. And this is why I can never rewatch Game of Thrones. It doesn't matter what you want. I don't want it. I don't want it. Daenerys is our queen. She shouldn't be. You are my queen. I don't know what else I can say. You are my queen. While she... She is my queen. And you will always be my queen. You are my queen. Now, like I've said, the ending here is not shit, but it is significantly lower quality. And so it does make it harder for me to say, yes, the 70 to 100 hours I've spent is worth it. But so, is Baldur's Gate 3 worth it? I mean, there's a lot to love here. The combat is great. The character creation and gear and progression are great. However, the story and performance, for the most part, are great, but it kind of falls on its face a bit in Act 3. But part of me kind of feels like that's because Act 1 and Act 2 are so perfect that because Act 3 isn't, it stings a little bit more. You know, in the end, this game does so much great. And when you think about it, this game really doesn't do anything too new or groundbreaking. You know, we've seen games with great intricate stories and characters. We've seen games with great turn-based combat. We've seen games with unparalleled freedom and choices. However, this game is some of, if not the best in what it does. It brings it all together while also adapting a beloved and cherished board game near perfectly. So even if this is not creating a whole new way to game, it is make how we game pretty much perfect so because of this 
I'm able to mostly look past the drop of quality in Act 3. Act 3 is still good. While Act 1 and 2, I'd give perfect 10s. Act 3, I'd have to give a 7 or 8. Probably an 8. So kind of balancing everything out. My final score for Baldur's Gate 3 is a 9 out of 10. A 9.5 maybe, somewhere between a 9 and a 9.5. I don't really like halves, so I'm going to give it a 9. It is near perfect, and this is the new benchmark for RPGs, and definitely a game of the year contender. And with that, yes, the game is worth it. It's definitely worth the money. Now is it worth the time is a bit more tricky, because damn it sure is long. If you're willing to put in 70 hours of your life away, then yes, the conclusion is overall satisfying. It does have its issues though. You know, I hear Larian is working on polishing up Act 3 and adding a bit more of a robust ending, maybe even a little bit more content down the road. Maybe that would be a better time to jump in and invest 70 hours into the game just so you really round off the experience. And thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know if you agree with this video, if you hate BG3, or if you think it's the perfect game and how dare I slander its name at all. Or perhaps you agree with everything I say and think I'm just a big galaxy brained gamer who never does wrong. See you and have a wonderful day.